Hey oh everybody, Haku here with my review for Kubera chapter 6 through 11, or the uh, Queen and a Bum arc. Uh, as usual, for these reviews, I'm, well I say as usual, <laughs> as if this isn't the second one for this series. Uh, so if you're only watching Kubera stuff, uh, the way I'm going to be doing it, I'm going to talk in depth about each chapter here and the afterward stuff that I thought was important for that chapter. Um, so yeah, just sit back, relax, and let's talk about Kubera for a while. I really liked A Queen and a Bum. Uh, I'm, like, enough ahead in, like, the read-through videos where, looking back, I forget to mention that, like, I'm so used to being like, oh, I really like uh, Brilith and Agni that I almost forgot to mention here that this is, like, the intro to Brilith and Agni, and I'm just kind of assuming that you all are, like, already on that same page of, yeah, we know what's going on, uh, we just want to see your thoughts and all. So, um, that's sort of where I'm starting with, but either way, I enjoyed this, obviously. Let's, uh, let's just start by talking about Chapter 6. Before I do, I think it's mentioned in one of the afterwords, so I'll probably talk about it when I get to that. Um, but... People who know Korean much better than I do, because I know, like, none of it whatsoever, have mentioned that the translation of Queen and the Bum, while accurate, Bum is more like unemployed person, and so it's like Queen and an unemployed person, and it doesn't have the same, it doesn't have as much of a negative connotation in Korean as the word Bum has in English, from my understanding. Um... So yeah, from my understanding, I, I feel like calling somebody an unemployed person sounds like, sounds like, I don't know, a disparaging thing to call somebody in general. But um, yeah, apparently people who know more than me say that in Korean it doesn't have as negative a connotation um, as the word bum does in English. But then too, you're, you're juxtaposing that with the word queen, which is like this, you know, royalty type thing. So I don't know. I don't know. That's just what I have read from translator's notes and the afterword and stuff. Uh, so I thought it worth mentioning since I brought up the title of the little arc. I guess I'm going to call these arcs. I could call them chapters, maybe. Um, but either way, let's start talking about episode six. So we get a bunch of lore stuff just starting us off here. And I feel like two a video like this, a video like these reviews, sorry, I'm just going to be constantly getting sidetracked as I just, I don't know, talk with you all about this stuff. Um, a video like this I feel like is helpful even if you're like 500 chapters ahead of me all the way caught up. Because um, like for me, I love rereading Tower of God and stuff and there's always stuff that I miss. So I feel like an in-depth breakdown like this, even from somebody who like knows not nearly as much as you, person watching this, uh, who is way, way ahead of me, um, maybe hopefully it's in-depth enough that you'll learn something that you overlooked before. Uh, or at least refresh, your or refresh yourself on things you already knew. Um, but either way, we get some lore drop type stuff. So we talk about magicians. Magicians can borrow the abilities of gods or shuras, but they were damaged by the powers of the shuras and disconnected themselves from them. Um, disconnected their links. The word link is used multiple times here, so I think that's an important thing. Um, the height of a magician, the greatest a magician can do or be, um, is generally considered summoning a god itself. Uh, the upheaval or cataclysm, whatever you want to call it, of year N0 frayed the link between the humans and the gods, and now only 11 gods remain linked to the humans. So I like this. Again, I've mentioned it a bunch before. I like when we get actual numbers so that we can be like, oh, we've heard of that one. Oh, we've seen that one. Um, by now, we've probably heard of or seen, even in this short bit that I've read so far, probably at least half have been mentioned. Um... So, uh, yeah, only 11 remain linked, and the remaining link between the gods and the humans is so weak that summoning a god, even if you fail at doing it, even just attempting to summon a god, is going to uh, potentially kill you. It's going to take away your lifespan or just be life-threatening in general. Uh, Brilith's mother is somebody who summoned a god and who, and who is no longer alive. Um, and we have Brilith, who is the priestess of Atera. Again, I keep forgetting that this is just where she was introduced. Um, she's hiding her pain and her exhaustion, and we get introduced to that. We get introduced to a person who's hiding their pain and their exhaustion. 
somebody who people trust, who they like, who they respect, and are very grateful to her. Uh, again, she uses the term semi-deify her. Um, and we see that priests in general are always physically and mentally exhausted from maintaining the closed space, which is basically an anti-Shura barrier around the cities. Um, but Brilith is, you know, extra exhausted because she has to maintain Agni summoning. Um, we have this, like, I love the scene when we, like, are first getting introduced to uh, Brilith and Agni and their relationship, and Brilith is just so cute. I love both characters. Um, I love the way her eyes are drawn. Um, and it's a secret from everyone else that Agni is the one who maintains the closed space, not Brilith. She maintains his summoning and he maintains the closed space. Uh, we have the first of uh, a few Idiot Smith scenes, which is great. Or I think in Korean, how did I remember this? I think it's Babo Kim. Um, I don't know how on earth I remembered that. Uh, but yeah, Idiot Smith. Uh, the comedy is so good, which is, I don't know, something that's sort of uh, recurring with Kubera. The comedy's just generally been good since I've started reading. I love the one panel of like the guards POV of them. That was really funny. Uh, they mentioned that there's a report of a red sky nearby. We learned that a village disappears with each red sky, which of course we saw happen to uh, Kubera's or Lise's. I'm going to be try. I'm so used to calling her Kubera, but I'm going to be trying to call her Lise because it differentiates her from the god Kubera and because it seems like most of the fandom and the uh, author call her Lise usually. Um, so I'm trying to remember that. Uh, the first Red Sky was reported near Calabloom, then near Rent Hollow, and most recently they've been near Eloth. We learn about a lot of the city's names. Uh, we are told that skies changing color is related to high-ranking Garuda clan Shuras using transcendental skills, but I don't know how specific that's going to be or stay, or if it's just going to be like, you know, high-ranking Shuras in general uh, change the color of the sky, but the color red specifically is for Garuda, or if the whole sky changing is going to only be a Garuda thing. I don't know how specific. I don't know how, like, literal I should be taking that, you know what I mean? Um, how seriously I should be remembering that. That's one of the things from reading something that's like 500 chapters long, is that Somebody, like, I watch tons of people starting out reading Tower of God and stuff, and of course I've been reading for over 10 years and reading very in-depth and stuff. So it's like, there are so many things that people are, like, paying attention to, when in reality I'm like, DVH, you don't have to remember that. It's not going to come up again. So there's probably a bunch of things that I'm going to get caught up in with these reviews or even my read-throughs. Uh, where I'm like, I'm remembering this information, and it's like, this information's not going to be important. <laughs> you don't need to remember this. Um, but that's where we get into the end of Chapter 6, and we have quite a bit of information from the afterward. Uh, so the afterward gives us um, Brilla's mother's name is Jibrilajas, um, and she is considered to be one of most people's top five magicians of all time, number five. Um, we have, yeah, so Gibralogist, and that is where, so over the past month that I've, um, I've been slacking on videos, every once in a while I've just been going and, uh, like, trying to learn a little bit of Korean, because I mentioned it before, I was like, ah, oh, man, it'd really help with these videos, especially with the, um, Omniscient Reader videos, and I've always thought it would help with Tower of God, so at least being able to read a little bit of Hangul now, even though I know, like, zero words, I at least know how the letters sound, I can at least, like, look and be like, oh, that's pronounced Ajas, like, whereas before I would have been like, Without looking at the Hangul, I would have been like, just A-J-E-S, I have no idea how to pronounce this. Um, but uh, we have Brilith, or the information that Brilith speaks formally to Agni, which is a change from the best challenge, best contest, whatever the original version was, I think it was best challenge. Um, it's a change from that version, she now speaks formally to Agni. Um, uh, Kurigam says that Brilith generally keeps her thoughts to herself, and when she does speak, uh, she doesn't speak what she means. Um, like, her, her outward uh, words are not what her internal mind is thinking. Uh, there are two academies mentioned in the afterword, Marihorn Private Magic Academy, which is for teens only, um, and a Terra Public Magic, or 
the Aterra Public Academy of Magic. Okay, and here's where it gets weird. Okay, some more lore that was dropped. So, the public... Wait. So, yeah, there's a public academy in each city, and they accept anyone, regardless of age. Um, and the private academies teach general education and practical magic, whereas the public ones teach magic theory and practical magic. Universities test for all three of those things. But... Public academies produce better exam scores. So this is where I'm getting confused. So I'm like, what's the point of the private academies? So the private academies are harder to get into, um, are only for teens. So you're like, like locked out based on age. Um, but they produce worse scores. So I'm like, what's the point? Why not just always go to the public one? If the private one's harder to get into, there are limits and they don't produce scores as good. Um, so, I don't know. I was like, that that confused me a little bit. I'm like, what's the point then? Uh, so, from there, we will just move on to episode 7. And I'm actually going to make a cut here so that I can remember to put in chapters for the video so that you can see along the bottom which chapter we're on. Uh, I feel like that'll help out. Somebody, when I talked about doing the first review, said that they wanted me to, like, make separate, like, chapters, or at least put what chapter I'm talking about, like, just the number or something up on screen. That way they could, uh, at any given moment, when they're like, wait, what's he talking about? They could just check and know which chapter I'm on. So that's the way I'm doing it. I'm using YouTube's, um, video chapters to my advantage here. But, uh, yeah, let's talk about chapter seven. So chapter seven, second part of A Queen and a Bum. Uh, we start off with Asha roasting Lees, which is, like, some of the funniest stuff and some of my favorite stuff from these early chapters. Um, and I like this sort of serious moment or this scene or just the concept we're working with with Kubera or Lees where she's like, just because I'm not moping around doesn't mean I'm not hurting. Uh, because, yeah, she just lost everyone she knew. She just lost her family, her friends, everybody. Um, but yeah, she says, just because I'm not moping around and crying doesn't mean I'm not hurting. Uh, we get to see when they check in, Asha's rank is A++. Uh, we have the guy working there says that his sister's been a fan since El or Eloth College. I didn't remember that, so Roosh has a brother here. Um, Roosh being one of my favorite characters. Um, so we learned that Asha graduated college at age 16, and I love the entire scene where Kubera is like, how could you have graduated college at my age and you're only 20 now? And Asha's response is just like, even at 20, you could have trouble getting into college. Um, just more, more Kubera just, or Lee's just being absolutely roasted. Uh, we have a scene of Idioty Smith being bored. Um, so Lee's also getting distracted by mushrooms, just two kind of empty brain, uh, together. Then, um, we learn a bit about the monetary units, the Rav or the Rav is one monetary unit. So that's your base, your base Rav. Um, I'm going to say Rav rather than Rav. Um, so you have your base Rav, then 100 Rav is a silver coin, 1000 Rav is a gold coin, or vice versa, you know, gold coin is 1000 Rav. Um, so that's our monetary system. We have uh, a scene where Kubera or Lee's notes that Asha has both abilities and <laughs> both abilities and money. Some people only have one or the other. Uh, we just have more heavy roasting from Asha, and we end with Lee's meeting Agni and getting cliffhung on that. Uh, some more afterward stuff. So in the afterward. Kurigam mentions that the world of Kubera is technologically advanced, which is just one of those weird Naruto things where you're like watching Naruto and you're like, oh yeah, it's ninjas. They have like knives and stuff. And then every once in a while they'll pull out like, <laughs> they'll pull out like a VHS tape or something. You're like, and you're like, wait, 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 wait. Um, so Kubera is kind of like that, I guess, where you're like, oh, it's like this fantasy world. And then occasionally they're just going to pull out a refrigerator. Um, so, there are things like that, but they mentioned that the technology is advanced, but it's made not by factories, but by creation magic. There are entire creation brands, which are huge companies. Uh, Marahorn is mentioned when talking about big companies. Uh, the planet's name is Willarv or Wilrarv. Um, both 
the translator's note says that Kurigam has used both Willarv and Willarv. Uh, there's also a mention that that's where the name of the money comes from. Uh, the planet has no concept of countries, like di different nations. There are six cities, so I'm like, this, this is a small planet, isn't it? There are six cities, and there are no hostilities between the cities. Also, while there are rich people, and while there are powerful magicians, and like rich people and powerful magicians are kind of at a higher stage in life, there's no real nobility or class system. Um, and I think also it's maybe mentioned here, it's mentioned somewhere, that there's also no class system as in like, um, like fighters versus magicians versus rogues or whatever. They're all just magicians, even fighters are a type of magician. Um, and that generally people in the world of Kubera, priests, your leading magicians, all those sorts of people are chosen based on skill, not on lineage. But then again, your skill is also kind of determined by when you happen to be born. So it's like, are people just sort of trying to like gamble, like roulette wheel their babies? They're like, okay, nine months, we're having a baby, we're trying to aim for this day so that they'll be powerful. Um, are people just trying to roulette wheel their baby's birth like that? Um, but, uh, yeah, also this is where they do mention that queen and an unemployed person is a more literal translation, uh, and that it's actually a double meaning, not just about the obvious, Brilith and, um, Babo Kim, Idiot Smith, uh, Agni, um, not just about them, but even more about Asha and Lee's. Uh, so, yeah, from there we'll move on into episode eight. Getting into the next episode, uh, we have Agni having a vision of Lee's. I, I was going to say flashback, but a flashback, a flash forward. I can't tell if it's the future, the past, maybe some alternate thing that we haven't been introduced to yet. But he's having some sort of vision of Lee's. Um, and that's where we start off chapter eight. Uh, Lee's didn't know, didn't even notice that she broke something. We just get tons and tons of these instances early on, just showing us, hey, remember, she's super, super physically strong. Um, and that's part of the mystery behind it. Uh, we have Lee's judging Agni so easily based on his treatment of her. When she doesn't know him, oh, he's some sort of creep or something. When he's nice to her, oh, he's a really nice, he's a really great person. Um, we have the mention that Vishnu or Vishnu is gone now. Um, so does that mean that Vishnu isn't one of the 11 that still have the link to the humans? Um, and that's interesting. So there are more than 11 gods. It's only that 11 have links to the humans anymore. But then it makes you think, so are those 11 the only ones that have, like, birthday attributes? Or what about all the other ones? Because they don't have a link, do they not have birthday attributes? Um, complex. I guess that would be how it works, though, because if you don't have a link, you can't use magic based on them anyway. Um, so uh, Agni repairs things using fire, which uh, is also played for comedy a bit when he's trying to explain how everything uh, worked and how he's like, actually a magician. No, I'm not suspicious at all. Uh, we have best girl Roosh appearing in a scene with um, Asha checking in. And Agni can tell that Lise is crying on the inside. And I love their relationship. Uh, in the next few chapters, it gets developed more. I love all of the stuff between Agni and um, Lee's. It's just really, really, it's really heartfelt and like well-written from like a character moment perspective, but it's also still got the usual Kubera comedy and is really funny. Um, so I like all of that, but that's where we're ending chapter eight. Uh, the, the after, sorry, I just saw my first bullet point for the afterward. Uh, the afterward, Curry Gob says, Agni does not poop. Uh, he just sort of burns away the food within himself. Uh, so yes, confirmed canon, Agni does not poop. Uh, Curry Gob also sa says that there is a moon, but she doesn't draw the moon. So I guess there's more of a story behind that that we'll get later. Um... Uh, we have the mention that Roosh is a quarter, so uh, we know what halves and quarters are. It's like how much of a uh, mix between human and Shura you are. So Roosh is a quarter, which means that she has double the lifespan of a normal human. And the way that that works, because like it works differently in like different uh, like fictional things. Sometimes it's like, oh, these people live thousands of years. It's like, okay, but does that mean they're like a kid for hundreds of years out of those thousands of years? Like, is it proportional? 
or um, is it like they grow at a normal rate, then once they become adults, they basically just stop aging? Um, but this is proportional. Uh, so whatever Roosh looks like, her actual age is double that. Um, I mean, not like you can really tell what characters' ages are by looking at them in Kubera anyway. Um, but she's twice as old as however she looks because their aging is proportional to their double lifespan. Um, we, <laughs> we haven't mentioned that Agni's income is suspicious. He does repairs and he doesn't charge people for them, but he does accept rewards. Uh, and from there, we just uh, move on into episode nine. And in episode nine, we start off with that sort of Brilith meeting with the magicians, the like sort of temple magicians, I guess. They're like kind of the second layer of important people in the city of Atera behind Brilith. Uh, she's meeting with them. They talk about how upper class Garuda Chura have been seen with the red sky before. Um, Brilith's three disappointing magicians. They were so cool. In the flashback, they were so cool. I really loved their designs, especially the blonde one. I was like, oh my god, she's hella cute. And then, oh, they just become so disappointing, so cowardly. Uh, they used to be so cool. Um, but uh, yeah, they uh, mentioned that temple magicians are next in line after a priest or priestess and their candidates. Um, we have Lorraine Rartia mentioned, or Rasha Rartia uh, mentioned. And they say they're sending her to investigate because they're just cowards now. Um, and Brilith is still putting up a front to everyone, even though the summoning is killing her, like, straight up. Um, we have the Lees and Agni stuff then. All of their stuff, like I mentioned before, I kind of already mentioned it talking about last chapter. It's really emotionally beautiful, but also, like, really funny still. Um, and Agni tells her his real name. And that's where we end off for chapter nine. The afterword uh, talks about how this was originally going to include uh, Agni summoning, which we see later on, I think in chapter 11. Uh, but Kurigam decided to change it so that it would include the Lee's and Agni stuff here. Um, Lorraine Rartia is a free agent with no affiliations. And also Kurigam says that she drew the entire scene, drew and colored the entire scene of Lee's punching Agni, but it had like a serious tone. Like she drew, she wrote, she made this entire scene serious, and then she scrapped everything. She scrapped all of it, even though it was already drawn and colored, in order to rewrite the scene, but to be comedic instead. Um, so yeah, interesting note there that the entire scene was dropped and totally rewritten to be comedic. Um, but yeah, that, that's all for chapter nine. Blowing through a couple of these, a little bit less to talk about. Uh, let's move and talk to, uh, let's talk about chapter 10. Chapter 10 does start off kind of like almost where you would expect with Kubera not believing Agni that he's Agni. It's again, good character stuff, but also really, really funny. Like, like when Lee's is just like, you're going to go to hell for pretending to be a god. And Agni's like, you're going to go to hell for punching a god. And it's all like really, really good. Um, Agni also says that she's the opposite of Kubera, that Kubera's a big man with no variety in facial expressions, and um, that Kubera tore through the dimension into the human world and vanished. Also, uh, for my theories so far, again, don't spoil me on it. If you were to ask me my guess on why Kubera is named Kubera and all that, my guess is either one or two, and it's probably more complicated than that when we actually do get into it. I'm thinking either like a reincarnation type thing, like Kubera reincarnated himself into a human because maybe he wanted to be a human and have the human experience, or her father, what was her father? Was her father Lee's Hyas? Was that it? No, she's Lee's Hyas. What was her father's name again? I can't remember off the top. I've remembered so much of this video off the top of my head. Forgive me for not remembering that off the top of my head. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it was something highest though, right? Or was, no, it was some. It was Rowley's. Rowley's remembered it. See, the mom was some Anna highest. I don't know something highest. Um, yeah, Rowley's was the father. Either that, so Kubera either reincarnated himself into a human because he wanted to have the human experience. Or, because we know, like, Kubera was born roughly around N0, right? Um, so either that, or he 
is actually Rao Lee's. Or maybe, yeah, he, he either is Kubera, like Kubera Lee's, or he's Kubera Lee's father. He might not be Rao Lee's, though. He might be Kubera's father, and like I mentioned it before, a situation where he's Rowley's father, but then, but then uh, Rowley's was like an adopted father who raised her. Um, that could be potentially it, because uh, we haven't really got much of anything into her father yet. Um, I think that could be it. I was thinking before, sort of like a. Um, uh, sort of like an Assassin's Creed Odyssey, even though I meant I mentioned before I was like I hate that game, but sort of like that situation. Or it could also now I'm kind of realizing could be like even though most of this takes a lot of inspiration from like Hindu mythology, maybe it's taking some stuff from like Christian mythology, where like there was God and then Jesus had a human mom, but then Joseph was also like adopted human dad maybe it's one of those sorts of situations because again kubera was a god so then lee's highest is like human child from human mother but like rao lee's is like human adoptive dad like maybe that kind of thing so yeah my my two guesses whether he's rao lee's or not kubera is either kubera's kubera lee's dad or just reincarnated himself. Those are my two guesses. And again, like I mentioned before, it might be more complicated than that when we actually get into the explanation. Um, so yeah, getting back on track with episode 10, um, I just wanted, since we were talking about what happened to Kubera the God, I wanted to give my theories uh, so far, very shortly in. Um, so Asha finds Agni and... Um, Agni and Lee's, and Agni's confused by his insight into Asha, and he doesn't know whether to say anything about it or not. Um, Lee's and Asha are suspicious of Agni when he disappears, because they're like, you can't just use teleportation magic without using words. Uh, so they're suspicious when that happens. Um, and we get to learn that Lorraine and Roosh have been sent to investigate the Red Sky. Uh, from there, the afterword says that the Magician's Guild headquarters is in Eloth, and that all employees, even the custodians, are graduates from magic universities. Imagine you graduate a magic university and you're made the custodian. Like, wow. Like, not, there's a, not that there's anything at all wrong with being a custodian. It just kind of feels like, you know, I graduated from the same college as all these other people, and, like, you're, you're making me clean up after them. Um... Yeah, uh, but uh, we're told that Asha's from Eloth University, and that's it. That's it for episode 10. Uh, gonna move on, finish this off with episode 11. All right, let's talk about the last chapter of A Queen and a Bum. So we have episode 11, and we start off with some flashback stuff. We have the seventh month of year N5. Uh, we have Brilith secretly summoning Agni, even if it's at the risk of her own lifespan. Because remember, I mentioned before, even if she messes up, even if she fails the summoning, um, even if she fails the summoning, then she could die, or at least lose a bunch of her lifespan. And she says that. She says as much. Um, which makes me think, I wonder if we're going to get to learn more context of why she kind of rushed it. Because I'm like, honestly, really, you could have you could have maybe waited a little bit and not potentially killed yourself. Um, especially when it comes to the fact that she says that she shouldn't have been able to succeed. And I think the reason she did is because Agni chose to be summoned in a way, because we see that he likes being in the human world. He likes being with Brilith. He he wants this connection uh, with someone. So, yeah, I think Agni, maybe he kind of chose to be summoned, and that's why she didn't just die outright there, or why she didn't fail the summoning. Uh, but I was like, you could have maybe waited till you were a little older, a little stronger, maybe. But I don't know. Who knows? Maybe there's, again, more context surrounding that that we don't know yet. Um, and Agni was the only one, Brilith says, the only one to treat her like a person, basically, because everyone else basically semi-deified her. Everyone treated her like she's this great high priestess or whatever, but he just treated her like a person growing up with her. Um, we also learned that Agni changes his visual age to match Brilith's age. Uh, because of this, she sometimes forgets to be formal with him. And one 
one scene that I really, really love that's a really good character thing, because you can tell him changing his age to matchers, everything that Agni does with Brilith, he's, try he's trying to form that connection. He wants to have a connection with a person like that. And there's this scene where she's not formal with him, and she says, um, I think, and I quote, I messed up and felt like you were my friend. And that... That has to hurt so much because he wants this connection so much, but she's still like putting a barrier between them, being like, oh no, I'm a human and you're a god, and saying like, sorry, I messed up and felt like you were my friend. That's, man, that has to hurt so much for him. Uh, she also mentions that she has never seen Agni angry before, and once we get out of like the flashback, her growing up stuff, we get him returning after hanging out with Lise for all that time, and him being late and her scolding him for never being serious. And I like how the whole time she's scolding him out loud and we, again, hear, we get, we get like in the afterword I mentioned before, it mentioned that like what she says isn't necessarily what she's feeling. And it's usually she's holding back what she's feeling and being extra polite. But here it's almost reversed where she's scolding him for always being late, for not thinking about how she feels, for not taking things seriously when him keeping the barrier up and her keeping him summoned is keeping people alive and keeping people safe. But meanwhile, on the inside, she's like, I'm just taking out my anger on him from having a tough day. And like, she's hiding her pain and what she's going through because she's scared that he's going to leave her. And she's saying like, I really want to stop. I'm, again, just taking my anger out on this guy. I want to stop. I want to apologize. But she's just snowballed so much that she says internally that her pride is keeping her from stopping, from apologizing. Um, and then at the very end, he tries to respond to what she's saying. He tries to, you know, talk about it, but she just cuts him off. As soon as he tries to talk about it with her, she cuts him off and says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, and she leaves, which puts us at this point where she's apologized for speaking to him that way and left, but that hasn't helped her at all because she's vented, sure, but it's like they could have talked back and forth and he was going to say something that maybe would have helped her or maybe would have kept the conversation going so that they could have connected and worked through it but instead, she's just, again, put up this wall of, he's a god, I need to be polite, I need to say I'm sorry, and then she leaves. Um, so it's just this, because, I mean, the things she said aren't wrong either. I, the way I explained it makes it sound like Brilla's just a bad guy, but no, she's right. She's sacrificing herself. She's putting all this in. People's lives are at stake with her keeping him summoned and with him keeping the barrier up. Um, all of this is really important stuff, and he's not taking it serious. He did come home late. Um, she did have an extremely rough day with the Red Sky stuff going on and people not being reliable and putting everything on her. Um, so the things she said to him aren't untruthful, but the thing is, it's just a lack of communication, and that's what's sad because he's not really in the wrong and she's also not really in the wrong. There's just a miscommunication, a lack of communication between the two of them um, because it seems like he's looking for that connection um, and she's trying to put up that wall, trying to keep them separated as, no, I need to be polite to him because he's a god. And I think that one of the big things they're going to have to move to in the future probably is her sort of letting the wall come down. And it's weird to say accepting him as an equal, but just Again, yeah, just viewing him as a person um, rather than viewing him as this god up on a pedestal, which is, it's so interesting because now that I'm thinking about it more, this is what she thought about people. She thought people put me up on a pedestal and don't treat me like a person, but Agni treats me like a person. But here she's doing the same thing. She's putting him on a pedestal as a god when I think what she needs to develop in the future is maybe treating him like a person. Um and not treating him like he's above her, um, which is so interesting because it's usually like you need to treat somebody like a person, not like they're below you. But here it's the opposite, where what's getting in the way is her putting him up on a pedestal. That's so interesting. So uh, I believe that's 
Oh no, we don't we don't end the chapter there. We get to um Asha and Lisa's rooms. Asha locks Lee's in the good room because Roosh trapped the other room. Also, I love the small details of Asha just casually using a gold coin to test the traps. Um Asha's just so rich that she uses gold coins flippantly like that. Uh but that's where we end off at for this arc, whatever you want to call it. Uh the afterward there. Uh, Kariga mentions that Brilith's hair is so long that it's long enough to touch the floor, and that Brilith is always trying to copy her mother. Uh, mentions that Atera has a warm climate, that Rent Hollow is to the north of Atera, and the reason that Asha can't sleep in the same room as Lee's will be explained later on. And yeah, that's it. That's it for these chapters. I hope this review wasn't too much of a mess. I honestly like to just take... I take detailed notes, but I don't like script things out. I just have bullet points or whatever. Um, I like to take these detailed notes and I just like to sit down and talk to you all about whatever series. Uh, that's what a lot of what we talked about, like my theories on Kubera or some of the things I realized as I was talking um, or things that weren't even in my notes. I just kind of sat down, talked to you all about Kubera for a while. Um, I hope this was a good video for all of you. Again, it's kind of a difficult thing where I know some of you are like 500 chapters ahead of me, but I hope even for those of you who are 500 chapters ahead, I hope you enjoy hearing somebody talk about liking Kubera and talk about Kubera. Uh, maybe you were refreshed on things that you had forgotten or had looked over. Um, or maybe I'm just talking a lot about content that's not going to matter in the long run, and I just don't know that it doesn't matter yet. Um, but either way, thank you so much for watching. Uh, like if you did like this video and comment down there to tell me what you thought of these chapters of Kubera, my thoughts and all of that. Again, no need to over explain things. Please don't spoil things. Um, but uh, yeah, super interested to talk with you all more. Um, subscribe for more Kubera. I mentioned ORV here. I mentioned, to, I mentioned Tower of God here. So much more on the channel other than just the uh, webtoon stuff. There's anime and manga stuff too. I'd love to do more gaming stuff. That would be something I'd like. Um, yeah, I guess. Just subscribe for all that. Follow on Twitter if you want. If you want a link to the Discord server, just ask and I can give you a link to that. Uh, we can talk there, whether on Twitter or on uh, Discord. Anywhere really here in the comments. Just wherever you want to try to get a hold of me. I'm always open to talk to everyone. Um, and if you want to help support the channel to help me to continue to make videos, hopefully I'll make them at a quicker pace in the future. Um, but if you want to help support the channel, you can do so on Patreon, patreon.com slash hack with the tubes or a link will be in the description or uh, by joining as a channel member here on uh, YouTube. Thank you to people who are already patrons and members. Huge thank you to all of you. Thank you to Chosen Regulars, Etchy Zero, Evan Holly, and Remorsefuls, Magical Girl, FR Nono, Cherryton Students, also the Storyteller and David Langstaff, and Slayer Candidate, SG. Huge thank you to all of them for their support to help me keep making videos, and huge thank you to all of you for watching. Uh, but either way, that's it. Thank you so much, and I'll see you all next time.